Today I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Pat Bailey. Hello, well, Doug. How you doing? Let's just start right at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your growing up and your family, that kind of thing. So, um, yes, I was born in Sacramento, California, and I um, grew up actually mostly in Los Angeles. My family was originally uh, from New York area. Uh, my dad was born in Brooklyn, my mom in Montana, and then she moved over uh, into New York. So they were very East Coast folks, and I was kind of their wild child, California child. Um, I have a 16 year older than me sister, um, and I'll tell you up front, I'm 62, but I can never tell her age, because she gets really upset about that, but you can do the math. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it was funny because when I grew up, I went to Catholic school, and the thought was, was that she was my mom. It looked like a teen pregnancy. So my sister and I weren't very close when we were growing up. Later in life, we got much closer with that. And um, I was a tomboy, kind of from day one. Um, I played a lot of sports. Uh, it was always jeans. I hated the skirts and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then as I uh, moved along and got older, um, discovered more about myself. But went to Catholic school for 12 years. So I learned about discipline, service, fear, uniforms, all that kind of stuff, all the basics that you need for the community. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but I love the education. I learned a lot about, and those were kind of the good old days in Catholic school. Yes, the ruler was alive and well, and so there was some, you know, masochism that came in at that point. But I also learned about, um, you know, service to the community, uh, working and building together and being part of that community and to do good and to think about what you're doing with some ethics and values. Tell us about your coming out. That's actually a very interesting piece. Right. Um, well, it was interesting because when I was in high school, um, I met a woman and, and we were high school partners together. And we ran around and um, we got more involved. But we had that good Catholic ethic that you weren't supposed to be doing any kind of sex, much less same sex. We didn't even have a word for it. Uh, and I can remember that I used to sneak out, and this was probably when I was about 14 or 15, and um, I would ride my bicycle about eight miles to her house after my mom fell asleep. My mom was an alcoholic, would drink, pass out. She wouldn't know I was gone. I'd spend the night at my girlfriend's house. Her parents didn't know we were there. And then I'd ride my bicycle back home you know, in the morning. So it was that wonderful essence of trying to uh, be out and be creative without knowing what the word was for years. Uh, we kept having this imbalance though. It was like, I'd say, no, it was wrong, we shouldn't do this. Or she would say, no, it's wrong. So we actually, if I really had to count the number of times we really hit that middle ground where we actually discovered ourselves in our body, it was not very many times, but it was kind of my first awareness. And I, de I identified as bisexual for a long time because it was about a year after that that I had my first relationship with a guy. Um, and that kind of went on longer till I was about 27. And I, my relationships were with men and women. And I realized about 27 that I was really much more interested in women. And um, so I identified as lesbian then and dyke. Uh, those terms kind of came out. In Los Angeles, there was a really strong sports community. A lot of my coaches um, were um, lesbians. And so I had lots of models of how to live that life. Um, and then everything went along kind of fine until I got into my early 40s and discovered that some of the women I had been with transitioned and became men. And so I couldn't call myself a lesbian in good faith if I honored their transition. So at that point, there wasn't, you know, omnisexual or, so I called it bisexual light is what I called it. <laughs> because I was interested in trans guys and those relationships were there. And now I just consider myself dyke, genderqueer, and queer. How did you come to join the Air Force? Well, career-wise, when I got out of, the, uh, got out of high school, um, I was the first in my family to go to college. Um, that wasn't something my family did. My dad was a post office worker and my mom was a secretary. My sister was a mom. College. Uh, she went a couple of years of college but didn't graduate. Um, and I became a PE teacher. That was what I studied. So I am the stereotype. <laughs> um, I did track and field, softball, you know. So I was in lesbian mecca from day one of my life just by doing that. And um, so when I got out through college and I finished my degree, I was teaching, and I was at uh, Canoga Park High School, which is in uh, LA area, 
And some of my students actually got into the first women's class at the Air Force Academy. And they came back and they go, hey coach, they've got teams and they need women coaches. They don't have any because the women hadn't been there before and they hadn't thought about staffing and putting women coaches there. So I decided, hey, that'd be cool. I'd love to teach at college rather than high school. So I went to the Air Force recruiter and I said, this is what I want to do. And he goes, well, we don't have that job, but we've got this other really great job over here. And, but it's not an officer, it's an enlisted. So I had a degree already. And what was happening for me in that moment as I was living in Los Angeles was I was on a softball team and anybody who plays on you know community softball teams knows that when a couple breaks up on a team, you have to form another team. And then there's a whole league that forms of everybody's breakup with all that. And I was having a very dramatic breakup with that, at that point with my partner. And so I always termed it that what I was doing was joining the Foreign Legion and kind of running away. <laughs> so I joined the military and uh, I, I did a lot of training there, so I was an educator there. Um, but they didn't quite see fit for me to kind of move into um, the education that I wanted to, which was at the academies and things like that. But it was fun and basic training because the day I walked in, my technical instructors, I looked at them and they were cute, two cute, hot, twin redheads. And I went, oh yes. <laughs> the little gaydar went off. Went off, they looked at me and, and kind of went, you know, wow, okay, this looks like a little baby dyke. And so they ended up making me dorm chief and I graduated from basic training, uh, went to, immediately got selected for officer training because I had all the requirements. And one night, my two drill instructors said, let's go out for a drink. I went, okay, that sounds good. You know, we were connecting up. I didn't know too many people in San Antonio. And we ended up uh, going to a lesbian bar, and they're all nervous. They're going like, well, if you don't like this place, you know, we can leave right away. It's just a place that we know about and we hang out. And I walk in, I, and we get to the bar, and I said, oh, I've been here before. And they go, why didn't you tell us? <laughs> and this was long before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. This is when the witch hunts were around, and people got kicked out quite frequently and doing those kind of things. But what they had done is they had actually brought women who were retired and still active duty, high-ranking officers, uh, who were also lesbians, who sat down and talked to me about how to survive in the military and how to do this. And they were my mentors. And it was an incredible gift that they gave me. And so I was out and queer in the military in my own way, which I, it was funny because I went to a couple of IMSLs during my career, but nobody ever knew I was there. You know, it was registering under another name, never in the cameras, the yellow badges and things like that. Uh, but I felt like I had to kind of pay my whole debt back to them by being out and supporting other folks who were out. And I was under investigation, I think, three times when I was in the military. Uh, the first time was my first assignment playing softball, uh, but I was the only officer on the team. And they tend to bring the enlisted folks in. The security would question them. And that kind of gets into the next part of the story we can talk about a little bit, which is more how I got involved in the leather community. But I knew a lot of the leathermen that lived in the community. So I started doing matchmaking.com. And so there were gay leathermen who were hanging out with dyke softball players. And they would say, go have coffee. And then when the investigators would come in and say, no, I've been out with Joe and we've done all this. And so it kept the pressure off the team a little bit. Um, I went to Alaska and I was up in Alaska for a year, which has been fun this year with Syrah. Uh, coming from Alaska, and I was under investigation there and it got dropped. And then later in my career I was under investigation um, based on my security clearance. I was with a woman at the time who was the pastor of a, a metropolitan community church, MCC, and my security clearance was such that I had to um, disclose who I lived with. So I put that on there and they came to me in the security clearance and said, well, we understand the person you live with um, runs a lesbian church or a gay church. And I said, well, I think the way I practice my religion is not subject to a security investigation. Now, this was before a lot of the being out and all that kind of thing happened. And because um, the year before, on coming out day, I called up the Pentagon to change my religious affiliation. It had said Catholic when I came in the military. And I'm going, I'm tired of that. You know, I'm a, I'm a reformed Catholic and I just don't want to go back there at all. So I had her change it to MCC on National Count Coming Out Day. And she spent all day going, is that a Buddhist religion or is that, you know. And, but on my dog tags, and I wore them uniform night, it says MCC on it. And so, again, those little pushes of being out just a bit with all that. So that investigation, they said, well, we're not asking about that. We're asking if you're a lesbian. And I said I wouldn't answer it before, again, about two and a half, three years before Don't Ask, Don't Tell came out. 
And they said, we have to, we went back and forth. And that started a three year dance where they didn't take my clearance away, but they didn't grant my clearance either. So one of the things with a military career is you have certain points you have to hit, and if you don't, you don't get promoted. And what I learned from my gay brothers in the military is that those that were HIV and were caught for being gay didn't get promoted at 19 years and got nothing for their service. Wow. No retirement, no benefits, nothing that. Wow. And so it was a truly a, a, a concern of mine that I had missed that window when I needed to be a commander. Um, so I, I got another assignment, ended up in a Navy position. One day in a little envelope came my clearance, had been restored and it was good. But about that same time, Clinton had announced Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And on the day he announced that, I decided it was time to retire. And I had 15 years in, which usually you don't get benefits, but it was right after Desert Storm when they were drawing down the forces. So I got a full retirement, and I was able to uh, go ahead and get all my benefits with a little bit less money. And when I went to the 10-year um, anniversary at Hofstra University to speak on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, there were 10 members on the panel. I was the only one who could wear my medals because I was the only one who had gotten out honorably and got a pension in wow. doing that. So I, every year, every month when I get my pension check, that is my, I did it, and I'm standing up for those folks who met me in the bar, you know, 20 years ago. Fantastic. Well, how were you introduced to the kink community? <laughs> Um, that's probably one of those that ever since I was 10 or 12 and realized those kind of things, I knew it. I mean, those were the kind of fantasies. I can remember playing with the guys in the neighborhood, and I would tie them up, or they would tie me up. It would be cowboys and Indians is what we called it, uh, those kind of things. And, you know, it, it was fun and playful. Um, when I got in the military, um, I actually, um, the woman I met in basic training, and that's another story. We kind of, we're in the same dorm together and there were 30 women sleeping in the other room and we'd be in the day room making out and kissing and all this. <laughs> so I didn't, you know, my blood pounding in my ears knowing that somebody was going to walk in and catch us, but it was just so hot, I just had to do it. And I got lucky, I didn't get caught. Uh, as I got into my career, I found out that the job was very stressful and I was in charge all day as an officer. And I came home just exhausted and I just went, you know, I just need to let go and not be in charge. And she goes, well, do you want me to be in charge when I get home? Oh, yeah, that's cool. And so it kind of started with that. And about that time, my first assignment was in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I was at Luke Air Force Base. And uh, we, she was working with a guy in the office. She was a travel agent. And he, um, you know, he was this really great guy. He had him over for dinner a few times. Got to know him a little bit. And he was a member of the Phoenix Levi and Leather Club. It was a men's club there that is no longer in existence. Had about 24, 25 members. And he said, why don't you come on down and have a drink and have a beer with us? And so we found the men's leather community that way and found out there was a lore and a history. It was hot. And about 11 o'clock, all the guys would go in the back room and we'd go, night, catch you later, guys. You know, <laughs> Thanks very much. And like we'd go home and say, you want to try that? That was kind of cool. Did you see what that guy was doing? And kind of explored that way. Um, and we had parted ways with that. Uh, in terms of her being my partner, but my interest was definitely uh, queued up and I was starting to uh, look around to find that. And there's only about three of those guys that are still alive now. Most of them were, this was the 78, 79 time period, most of them were hit by HIV and AIDS and uh, got to march at the San Francisco parade with them one year because it is the only club I've ever pledged for. Because uh, they would, they were starting to say, "Well, you hang around, you're cool, you kind of, you know, look like a neat leather person." And they kind of taught me those traditions. And we did a lot of community fundraising when people were sick. You go help somebody when they had a motorcycle accident. So that again, that community service piece keeps coming through with that. And I know that um, you know, as we lost them, uh, that was part of the tradition that I bring forward too. So again, service, community, you know, helping others and doing that um, was really how I got started. And it took me a while to find the women's leather community. Um, and when I did, I think I found them in San Francisco. I think I went to uh, Folsom Street or some event. And the women scared me. <laughs> <laughs> they had blood and they were cutting and they were yelling and screaming and punching. And the men's leather community was not exactly of that. It was all about, you know, sucking, fucking and having a good time and, you know, a little, little bit of pain and stuff like that. But it was more the erotic, hot and heavy kind of stuff. 
So it took me a little while to kind of get adjusted to the women's community. And I think somewhere in my past, Sharon and I had crossed paths, because as I started to move up to be a title holder and all that, I went up to Seattle. And that was one of the parties I went to going, oh my God, what are you people doing up here? Uh, you know, they're putting up sheets and tarps and there's blood splattering on the walls and all this kind of stuff. And uh, although I didn't meet, uh, meet Sharon at that point, uh, that was one of the areas that I moved into. So it's fun. I've had a great time. And it's expanded and grown since then. What sort of expansions and growths have you seen? Well, for me, in terms of uh, my growth, you know, it's that never say never. You know, it's like, oh, all I want to do is a little slap and tickle and a little bondage, and then I want to do this, and then I want to do needles, and let's check out this blood stuff and all of that. Um, <clears throat> but for me, what I learned from those men in Phoenix was really about that community service. I, I can, I've got a pin on my, I carry a, a set of pins that's on a leather panel that I wear when I get into kind of formal dress. And it's the Kinky County Fair in Phoenix, Arizona in 1979, 80, somewhere around there. And that was what they did. They brought the whole community together. I learned that kink and drag and rodeo and all those parts and segments of what we consider the other parts of the community we don't hang with. In a place like Phoenix, you got to work together. So I was able to cross back and forth all of those lines. And so I know that when I did my speech, when I ran for EMSL, you know, I was going, dykes in the house, say hey, you know, gay, gay, guys, fags in the house, say hey, you know, all that kind of stuff. That came from a drag queen up in Alameda. That was the way she'd always start her shows. And she's still in the community, and we catch up once in a while, but that's the connections that I've seen. And so now, uh, if anybody knows Lady Sharon, uh, you know, who's my lady, you know, all kinds of blood and pain and things like that. So I'm definitely a masochist. I'm a boy. I love service. I'm not a slave. Uh, and I love to excel and do community stuff. So I don't know there's a community hanky. I have to make one of those. It's, Here's your it's, opportunity. It's clear. Yeah, it's clear. What, what is that? It's clear. Yeah, Karen also created it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Missed that. So there's a clear hanky that I did not know about. There's there service. Go. There we go. <laughs> well, you were married to a man at one time. Please tell us about that. I was. I, I, it's kind of funny uh, because I've actually been married three times. Uh, the first time I had missed that, you know, right after high school, everybody goes off and gets married, and I, that didn't interest me at all. Graduate from college, everybody gets married after that, gets settled in, missed that. And I got my master's, so I had a master's degree in physical education and a pre-med degree uh, when I got out of college. And I met a guy, and he was black, and we just really had a good time together. We became very good friends very quickly. And I had grown up in the 60s. We had watched a lot of the TV and you know, all the civil rights movement. Catholic Church definitely stood up for a lot of the Freedom Riders and all that kind of thing. So my media, the way that looked, and the way my community responded, was always about, this isn't right. Segregation is wrong. You should change that. You should move forward. And then I brought a black man home for dinner one night. <laughs> Suddenly that theory kind of went out the window. Um, I also was in school at the time, Vatican II, which is when the Catholic Church turned every rule in the world upside down. You can now eat meat on Friday, you know, they got rid of limbo, they did all this stuff, and if there's any Catholics in the audience, I know you're going like, oh yeah, I remember that. And so, it was like everything I had been taught had been kind of turned upside down. And it kind of drew us together, because he was a military brat, and he had traveled around with his family all over Europe. So he also had an experience, the U.S. experience, of being black in the United States. And as a result, we ended up getting married. My sister did not come to the wedding, uh, and it caused lots of issues in my family. As kind of a side note, my dad had died when I was 13. And again, in my teens, I, I kind of laugh about this, because my mom was older when she had me. And I'm going into adolescence. My mom is going into menopause. So the only way a respectable Catholic man could get out was to die. And literally, it was a crazy wild household with an alcoholic mother who was also rageaholic. Taught me my rageaholic kind of behavior. Uh, and it was just, I was out all the time and kind of running. I was lucky. I got involved a little bit with drugs and things like that. It didn't destroy my life because I was always that person who wanted to go out and do more. So again, one of those lucky survivors who didn't quite get that. Um, but basically, so that was my first marriage. It didn't last very long. And the reason that we broke up is because I didn't learn about this open relationship kind of stuff. So we both cheated, but we cheated on the same woman. 
Oh. Oh. I thought it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I was still bisexual in those days. And so um, it was basically kind of a moment to go like, hmm, okay. Uh, and so we broke up, and he's still in contact. We still talk with him. My second marriage was the man that took me into the leather community, who I kind of consider my leather daddy, uh, although he doesn't kind of do that role kind of position. <laughs> But he um, had a bout of hepatitis and was really sick and needed some help and didn't have insurance. I'm in the military. They're bugging me about, my cousin is coming to town. Why don't you have a date? And I'm going, mm, I'm in a relationship, you know, and trying to dance around that and be obvious. I married him and all that happened. The only problem when we were in Phoenix is I would take him out to the base and it was an air, air base. And he would go into the back bar, and the German pilots were back there. And he has it for chance for German pilots. So I had to keep dragging him out so he didn't, like, you know, blow the cover on that. Um, we ended up getting divorced when my partner at the time got pregnant and um, had my son, Josh, who's now 25. Uh, and then uh, she was the mother, I was the, the other parent. Uh, and he's not real aware of that, that, of that relationship, because she got cancer six months after he was born and has had major health things, but came back, she's fine, she's got another couple of kids. But at the same moment that she was getting ready to have him, Bob, um, my leather daddy, his partner, his love of his life was dying from HIV. And so literally two weeks before my son was born, I was going on a flight <coughs> to bury his partner, and I have the birth of a son. And we kind of looked at each other and we went, wow. And we lived in Texas, and there's a lot of community property there. So on a purely financial part, it was like, all right, we got to break up for that. Uh, but again, we stay very, very close, and we're together with that. Um, then I've gotten commitment ceremonies with a couple of, um, of other partners that I've gone through. So um, I actually, on the day, don't ask, don't tell, or I'm sorry, uh, Defense Marriage Act fell, um, I asked Sharon to marry me. And she said yes. And um, so we're getting married in, in September. Um, and uh, it's really exciting because it, it's the first time I'll be able to marry a woman yeah. and Yay. love of my life. Fantastic. <laughs> that was the comment she made about being fiancés. <laughs> you, building on all of this, you have very interesting professional work. Tell us a bit about your professional work today. I'm a professional gay. That's what I do. <laughs> My job, I'm director of training at Out and Equal Workplace Advocates. And it's a 501c3 that works with corporations to create inclusive environments for LGBT employees around the world. So I work with benefits and policies, uh, climate, those kind of things. So my job is to go out and tell corporations to be nice to queers. Um, and it's interesting because I can be very out. My job is really to be the you know Google events, learn what's happening, help to train individuals. But when I won the um, Creating Change uh, Leather Leadership Award from the task force, um, I had to do that come out moment. I had to go tell my boss, look, I'm getting this award. We're working with corporations. Um, I'm already planned to do some training from my day job there. If you want me to back out of that, I will. Uh, and also realize that there's an honorarium. That honorarium is not coming to my day job. That's about the leather community. Um, it took them a little bit. They actually had to have a couple meetings about it. So that leather phobia in the workplace, even in, a, in an LGBT organization, is still very much there. Uh, it went fine. It went great. But I've actually had one company talk to me um, who's deep in the South, has never had these discussions before. They Googled me and found me. And they said, we don't have a problem with it, but we're not sure we'll be able to bring you in for training because our media will pick it up and our local radios will do that. I'm still waiting on that. They're still having that discussion. They haven't gotten back with me. But it is another coming out experience with that. And, uh, but I love my job uh, doing it. I've tried to retire twice now. <laughs> Uh, because I retired from the military, then I was a government contractor with Department of Energy when I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm not ready to be done yet, so. But I can retire as early as November if I want to. Fantastic. <laughs> Do you think you will? No. Oh. <laughs> the lady does not want me in the house that much. <laughs> well, please tell us how you came to IMSL and, and about winning your title. Okay. Um, I had been to, like I said, IMSO a couple times uh, in the background and seen it, thought it was very, very cool. And when I retired, 
from the military, I said I will never go back in the closet again and I will be out. And by that time I had been into leather for 15 years or so. So I decided to get more involved with the community and I was actually living in Santa Cruz um, and San Jose had a very vibrant community. So what's so fun about this weekend being at IMSL uh, this year is it's kind of a homecoming for me because I was Miss Leather Master uh, 1995 uh, right before my title, uh, I went to go run at IMSO, the community title of Miss San Jose Leather came out of whatever bondage it had been in by whatever club member who owned the title and the rights to the name. And so I became um, Miss San Jose Leather right before the contest. And it was so short that it happened that I didn't have a title vest. So Jeff Tucker, who was International Mr. Leather in 1994, uh, came along and he took one of his old vests and we took the R off of his because he was Mr. San Jose Leather and we studded in an S. Oh. So the vest that I wore and it was, that I ran to compete with the San Jose contest was um, Jeff Tucker's and I passed it down. And I had an incredible set of men mentors here in the community. Gabriel had been from San Jose. If you ever watched my competition, I had a silver lame jacket that kind of became the, the symbol of the community because Gabriel had made that popular. Uh, Graylin Thornton had been drummer and uh, he lived here in the community. And uh, my title, Sasha and then Kevin Roche, uh, we were having a great run and it was a really fun time in San Jose. Again, where clubs were all coming together and doing that. And uh, I went to the contest. Um, actually, I had applied for medical school because I had that pre-med degree. And I was going to come to, as a requirement of the title, to EMSO and ready to tell them, look, I'm going to med school next year. This would be really nice, but I probably can't really do justice to this title. Uh, I got my last rejection from the medical schools that I went to uh, and applied to about five months before the contest. And I said, what the hell? I'm going to run for it and go for it. So uh, as it's fun to be here in kind of a transition year because my year was a transition year as well. Uh, the San Francisco board had said they weren't going to produce another contest. Amy Marie had picked it up and she took it on the road and I won my contest in Chicago and there were 19 contestants in my class. Uh, they had to make a cut uh, and so I made the top 10. Uh, it was really fun uh, in this theater in Chicago and, and all the performance stuff that went on with that. Um, and we get to the end and the person who was supposed to be the big winner, that was who the favorite was there, uh, and I are still standing on the floor. And I thought I did fairly well, but I really didn't know how I'd done. And I went, oh wow, okay, I guess I didn't make the top three. And then they called my name and I got up there. I found out after I didn't win a single category. I was second or third in all of them, but because of my overall score and doing well and being able to do all the parts of IMSL, that's how I won. So I was the first IMSL of the second generation. Well, tell us a bit about the recent IMSL changes. What's going on and what can we anticipate for the future? Well, it says Sunday, we're here, we're queer, we're leather, we did it. <laughs> um, so much, much less theoretical. Now, um, I know when Doug and I talked about these questions a little further back, it was going, well, this is kind of what we hope, and now I've got a lot more tangible pieces with that. But uh, what happened with us last year is that um, we were going along. Um, I was an IMSL alumni, which is one of the perks and benefits of being an IMSL. You come here, you get to play, you get to do whatever you want. Nobody really has very many expectations of you. You get to walk up on stage once, maybe you do some classes, and that's kind of your role in that. Uh, Sharon uh, had been involved on the registration side and was doing some great work and revamping that, making all that work. And it came to light to us, um, Glenda Ryder is part of Sharon's family, uh, in terms of the leather family. And that came to our attention that in fact monies were being misappropriated for charities or hadn't gotten there and things like that. Glenda came to us and asked us if we would buy it, to Sharon and I to buy into from her. Uh, first thing we said was, hell no. Uh, that was not in our plan. Uh, Sharon was a bit more emphatic about that because she was dealing on a very personal level with that as well. But for me, it was like, that's not in my plan. I had tried when Amy uh, in Gen 2 sold it to Glenda. I was the first bid. And Amy and I were in negotiations for quite a while. And we just couldn't close the deal to sell it. So I was <coughs> attempting to buy Imsel eight years ago. Um, and that did not happen. 
Glenda picked it up and moved forward. So it was like, I, that ship has sailed, I'm kind of done with that, and we'll move forward. Um, what happened a day or two after that is Sharon got a call from Spencer Berkset, who is an old friend of hers um, from the Seattle area, and I got a call from John Krongard within hours of each other on the same day. And both of them said, you need to take this. This is important. This is an important contest. We love it. We want it to continue. You need to do this. Now, we thought for a while they were in cahoots, that somebody had, in the big uber leather elder council <laughs> had come along and said, yes, you are the title holders. You will do that. You will take that. Uh, in fact, they did. That was a spontaneous on both of them. Glenda had a lot of other offers on the, on the um, IMSL Productions part of that. And... Um, looked at them and decided that it was what she wanted, her preferences were to give it to us. When Amy bought Imsel from the board in San Francisco, she paid them a dollar. What we offered Glenda was a dollar. And that she would keep all of the debt to the charities and to the other areas that she still had to pay. And we would start clean. We'd start with nothing, but we would start clean as a new Imsel Productions. Um, and then Sharon and I, of course, talked about what well, the part she doesn't like is fundraising, education, uh, dealing with the title holders, you know, on a day-to-day -day kind of basis, and the history stuff. She just throw that stuff out. Sorry, I know. <laughs> Cover your ears. <laughs> and that's the part I love. So Sharon used to produce Power Search. She was one of the early organizers of Power Search. So she likes to throw a hot weekend. And I think what we found this weekend was that it, this is a hot weekend. People have been having fun. It's a good contest. It's gone really well. And I get to do what I love doing and created what was called IMSL Foundation. So it has kicked off. We've had an amazing response. I talked this morning in the brunch that we already um, have gotten in for the travel fund for the title holders over $6,000. Um, so they'll each get $3,000. And I Saran or what the fuck video from bathrooms all over the United States and Berlin and everywhere else uh, I just brought in another over a thousand dollars so um, so that kind of money's my goal and my passion is to make sure the current Himsel and Bubba can travel and have the kind of experiences I got to have and hopefully not go into debt at 15 to 16 thousand so that's where we're kind of going because we're excited this year um, one of the new feeder contests that's coming to Imsel is the Miss South Africa contest that's going to happen in um, uh, December and I was at LLC a couple weeks ago and uh, Yaku uh, did a kind of strip uh, and raised twenty six hundred dollars for that travel fund and what I was so honored about was that both Cowboy Jen and Yaku came to me and said, this IMSO Foundation is where we want to put that money to hold for the Miss South Africa Travel Fund. So we've got a designated fund that when that person you know, wins that title, that their travel and trip will be taken care of. Now a little beyond the scope of what we want to do for IMSO Foundation overall, but is a big part of that. So it's been crazy, it's been wonderful. I'm tired today, but um, <laughs> after three days of this, but it's people have shown up and have had a wonderful time. So I thank the communities and the title holders and the contestants. We prayed that we would get at least a contest. We wanted at least two boot blacks and two emsels. We ended up with eight emsels and two boot blacks and had an amazing class that believes in what we do and really move forward. So, if you could do anything you wanted and had no limitations whatsoever with IMSL, what would you do with it? <sighs> We've learned a lot, and there's a lot of debriefing kind of aspects, but if I really take a longer look and say what's that strategic part, I think I want to try to find a place where I don't have to retire again. Um, you know, my work in the LGBT community is really fun and exciting. But if we can grow this foundation with grants and the things we want to do and the work we want to do with history and increasing education and a small community could get a grant from us to bring an educator in, that we could have the title holders who could train and, and, and build up and be our representatives and get to where they need to go, um, I would love to be the executive director of that organization as IMSL Foundation and that I would work with this weekend as one of the projects that we would work with as the 501c3. Uh, because I believe this community, I, that's why LLC's, Yaku's fundraising was so good, is despite all the stuff we've seen over the last year in terms of monies and finance and all that stuff happening, 
that this community still wants to give and still has that heart that I learned way back in Phoenix in those first days. You were honored with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Leather Leadership Award. Please tell us a bit about that. I felt old. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the previous winners of that, Guy Baldwin, you know, Grayland Thornton, Judy, uh, or Vi, I'm sorry, um, and those are the folks that were my mentors. When I, when I won the title, they were the elders who came up and said, good job, kid, here's what you gotta go do, go do this. And I had been at Creating Change, and I, I go for my job and things like that. We had just finished our big workplace summit, and I got a call um, from Sue Hyde. And we chatted for a while, and it was one of those kind of 501c3 to 501c3 kind of conversations. And then she dropped the bomb that you bet selected, uh, you know, as the award winner this year. It was only the second woman. Wow. And uh, Vi Johnson was the first. And I just kind of shook my head going, me, you know. Um, for me, I am always a boy in service. And I, I do that because I love what I get from that. Um, I get a lot of stage time. I'm an extrovert. Open refrigerator door, I'm on because the light goes on. Um, but I love just being able to serve and make it better and to see a path forward. And so thinking about getting up in front of 4,000 people and talking to them who are LGBT queer, intersexed, questioning, and allies about who we are as leather is a humbling experience. Uh, because I may be the only voice that they hear about who we are in the community and that we are standing toe to toe with them, boot to boot, uh, to be with them. And so uh, getting up there was just an amazing experience and I was really, really honored. And the timing was amazing. We had two comments to it. The first, this happened after we bought IMSL, and I said, well, maybe if you buy IMSL, that's what you get. <laughs> the community gives you an award. But because it was selected by the former winners. And so that council of elders that we shall not speak of uh, <laughs> basically said, we, we endorse you. We think what you're doing is important and going forward. And with that, that award came a $5,000 honorarium. Wow. And with that honorarium, that's how the foundation started. I, we're going to talk about in the in the coming days about match grants, but you know I put two thousand of that in the account already to start the foundation, and I'm going to go ask other people to match those funds and to put the other three thousand in as we needed. And so it was so serendipitous to say, "Wow!" Uh, so it seemed like in my life I've always found that if it is easy and it flows, that's what I'm supposed to do. If I struggle and try to make it happen it's not the right thing to do. And this has been that kind of easy flow. <clears throat> what does mentoring mean to you? It's been fun. I've kind of transitioned. That I thought I was just going to have to be the alumni, and I didn't have to do all the kind of out front work anymore. And so I, when I was in Albuquerque um, until about uh, 2008, I grew the community. We did events. I was bringing other people up. And we began to talk about how do you bring the next generation in and talk to people. And I am so proud of the fact that Jason DeBoy and Tyler McCormick were both folks who came to me very young in their leather days and just talked to me about it. You know, I wasn't the first line mentor with them, but they came and they asked me that. And when Jason won International Miss Boot Black and Tyler won International Mr. Leather, I could not have been prouder. So I realized that for me, that sense of sharing it, you know, Joe Carter, you know, Emsel 1996 said, each one teach one. You know, we've got amazing skills and abilities. And part of that foundation belief is really to make it a professional development. You know, I can do it, yes, but I need somebody who's half my age to do it. And I need them to find somebody who's half their age. Because otherwise, clubs come and go, groups come and go, titles come and go. And we're not going to be a community if we have to keep riding the surf. Yeah, that's true. What's the biggest misconception about you? Huh. Probably that boy to me means only submission. I am not a submissive. <laughs> Anybody who knows me, and sometimes when people only see my exterior part, they go, you're a bottom, you're a boy. That's amazing. Um, that I have found in my life 
that being a boy and doing good service, when somebody says to me, your job is to go out and do that the best you can, I'm doing it because I'm under order and I love to serve. And that I'm not doing it because I'm topping the community or something like that. It's really about community service. And I love that. So thank you all for <laughs> indulging me this weekend <laughs> in my service fetish. Could we stop for a little while? Safe word. <laughs> so. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Pat.